Uh, Maxine uh, is, a, is a, as I said, a 17 year resident of Salt Spring and has been very, very active. And in looking at water issues on Salt Spring, in helping Salt Spring community to deal with these water issues. Uh, and she's done that in the capacity as the now retiring president of the Salt Spring Island Water Preserva Preservation Society. So really wonderful to have you, Maxine, today for the panel. Our second speaker will be Gord Baird. And Gord is a certified rainwater harvesting designer and installer who specializes in potable water home commercial systems and community water systems. He's also the vice chair of the CRD Regional Water Supply Dis Commission. And Gord lives in, in Victoria, not far from our son and daughter and two grandkids. Uh, and he is um, he runs a, a really interesting permaculture nursery and farm that's focused on water conservation and it's called EcoSense. So I hope some of you will be able to use his services and, and visit his, his uh, facilities and, and businesses. And finally, we have Grant Wicklin. Grant's a character on Salt Spring Island. Uh, he's done a tremendous amount of work here in the community, helped with so many of the projects that the community has done. He's a 40-year resident, and he's built, I, I learned recently, he's built 10 houses and four large ponds on the island, and he's working on a new pond. Grant was trained as an immunologist, uh, but he's developed all kinds of expertise in marine engineering and the biology and geology of soils and clays. So he's going to bring us some real incredible expertise. He's also, by the way, put up uh, rainwater harvesting systems using tanks. So another expert uh, between the three of them, we have a real terrific panel for you today. So um, what I'm going to do is just speak to a couple of uh, uh, issues about how you might be able to afford to purchase a rainwater harvesting system. So I'm going to share my screen uh, here. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a, a, a screen showing uh, the possibility for a low interest loan that you can get if you join the, uh, the organization called the Transition Salt Spring Enterprise Cooperative, Cooperative. And it's known on the island as TSEC. It was established in 2011 uh, for, the, for the purpose of providing financing and investment opportunities for transition salt spring objectives. So looking at how we can deal with climate change, uh, transition salt spring Enterprise Cooperative is, is helping people to finance that. Uh, and through membership, you can, you can get uh, low interest climate action loans uh, that will help finance purchases of equipment such as water tanks that help address climate change. So for more information on that, if you would just go to transition salt spring enterprise cooperative.com, that would be terrific. So what we'll do, I'm gonna, Go out of sharing right now if I can find my. Here we are. Thank you, uh, Aaron Ann. Um, if I can find, uh, I'm going to go um, speak to uh, how you can ask questions along the way. We're going to have four four spoken sessions from each one one from uh, two of our one each from two of our our panelists and Gord Baird will be t talking twice to two different parts of it. Uh, and uh, they'll talk for roughly about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions for their topic. Uh, Maxine will start it off with groundwater issues, current and future. Uh, and if you have a question, there's two ways in which you could address that. If you have a, a Zoom interface, which allows for you to, to uh, raise your hand, then please do that. and. Uh, please remain muted during the presentation. This avoids any kind of dogs barking in the background. Uh, and if you have a question, you can raise your hand and we'll get to those questions at the pause after that presentation. Or you can write, type into the chat room uh, a question that you might have. So um, 
we'll be monitoring that chat room and I'll pass along questions directly. If you don't want to ask the question directly, but you would like somebody to ask it, just write it in the chat. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll start with Maxine, then Gord will talk a little bit about the issues to address before you start with a, a, a storage system. Grant will talk specifically about ponds, but probably carry over a little bit into some of the other sides. And then Gord will talk specifically about storage containers. So thank you all for coming. And it's just great to have our panel here. So I'd like to start with Maxine Leichter. Oh, hi there, everybody. Um, let me know if uh, my voice gets too low and I need to uh, speak late, louder, David, OK? Um, I'm here to tell you why saving rainwater is important. And the short answer is that although we have a six month wet season, we also have an equally long, mostly dry season and climate change may further limit water supplies. So I'm gonna talk about where our water comes from and why all sources are short during the dry months. And then I'll summarize likely effects of climate change. So all of salt spring water falls from the sky, mostly during that wet season from November through April. And that water is stored in our lakes and in the ground. Uh, David, could you show the first picture? Okay, so this is a graph that shows when rain fell last year. Along the bottom of the months, starting in January, and you can see that most of the rain fell in January, February, and then from October to December. So what does that mean? Well, first about ground, first I'm gonna talk about groundwater. And David, um, you can leave that picture up for now and then we'll switch to the next one in a minute. First about groundwater, about 40% of salt spring households get water from private groundwater wells. And there are also seven small water districts or services that use groundwater. Okay, David, next picture. So here is what our groundwater looks like. Now, Diana Allen, who's a professor at Simon Fraser University and an expert on Gulf Islands groundwater has told us in her visits to Salt Spring many times that our groundwater is stored in cracks from the previous year's rainfall. Now I've been told that the cracks are really much, much smaller than in this picture. So please regard this image as only giving you a general idea of what the, it looks like in the ground. So I wanna make a few points about the cracks. First of all, we don't know where they are or how big they are. Uh, if you put in a well and find water, we only know that there is water in that exact spot. But even then, it may be difficult to know how much water is there. That is, will it last through the dry season? We don't know where the cracks extend to or if they are connected to other cracks. And that means that we don't know if another household is drawing on that same supply. And this could be important because as new properties are developed, they could affect existing wells. Okay, David, you can take the picture off now. So next I'm gonna talk about what we do know. We do know that the north of the island is more likely than the south to have places with poor groundwater supply. This doesn't tell us about a particular property though, and that's because groundwater supplies are extremely variable. There can be a very productive well on one property, but not on the property next door. We know that people who get water delivered, likely because they don't have enough, these are mostly in the north of the island. We know that um, uh, the water service with the most severe shortage, which is Cedar Lane, is in the north, and we also know that drawing too much groundwater near the ocean can bring in salt and contaminate the supply. So that's all I'm gonna say about groundwater. Now I'm gonna talk about surface water. 59% of our drinking water here comes from four lakes, St. Mary, Maxwell, Cushion, and Weston. And each lake is different, but they all have a limit on supply. Uh, Weston Lake supplies the Fulford Water Service, and a study is in process now to find out how much water this lake can provide for human use. So we don't know that yet. Cushion Lake supplies the Bettis Water Service. 
And uh, Cushion Lake is shallow, so it doesn't hold a lot of water. And not much water comes into Cushion Lake during the dry season. So those users pretty much have to get along on what is there at the end of the wet season. And they do so by being very conservation oriented. Uh, now, St. Mary Lake and Maxwell Lake, our other lakes, supply the North Salt Spring Waterworks District, which is by far the largest with about 1800 connections. And that service area is much of the north of the island, Ganges, all our businesses, and an area south of Ganges. Um, and St. Mary Lake uh, also serves the Highland Fernwood Water Service, which has 320 connections and is the second largest on the island. So St. Mary Lake is deeper than Cushion Lake, but it has a relatively small watershed, which means it takes long to refill. There's also a requirement to release water into Duck Creek year round to protect the fishery there. Uh, so the lake can only be lowered by 0.7 meters or about two and a quarter feet. And that means that only the top two and a quarter feet of the lake is available for use. And of that, a bit more than half is lost to evaporation. The district has looked into raising the weir so more water can be saved, but that has not been feasible. So last, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about climate change and the information I'm gonna give you comes from the Climate Action Report. Uh, projections are for more rainfall coming in severe storms. And this is not good because when we get a lot of water in a short time, most of it runs off and it's not stored in the ground. Another projection is that most warming will occur in the winter, but there will be more warm days. Days above 20 degrees centigrade may triple from an average of 12 to 36 per year. Also forecast is less rain in the summer. And that's hard for rainwater collectors because we need that summer rain to replenish our rainwater collection systems. Also higher temperatures cause more evaporation from our lakes. With modest climate warning, evaporation losses are projected to increase by about eight to 10% in 50 years. Higher temperatures cause us to want to use more water for farm irrigation and gardens. At the same time, in, in, over the past few years, in order to encourage affordable housing, zoning changes have been made that allow some property owners to add suites and cottages to single family homes, meaning potentially more people living here. So to summarize, in the summer, we can expect less rainwater, more evaporation and more demand. So what can we do? And I just wanna mention a couple things that we can do in addition to saving rainwater. One is it's very important to protect our forest because they are critical to enabling more water to be saved in streams, lakes, and the ground. A forest with a healthy understory plants and decaying debris soaks up and holds water like a sponge, um, slowly releasing it during the dry months. And of course, it is important to conserve water by using it efficiently. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that's that's a great summary of the situation, and you you made your time perfectly. Uh, uh, and uh, I wondered now if there are any questions specifically for uh, Maxine about this. Uh, you've had some thank yous. It's a, it, a wonderful presentation already, Maxine. Uh, anybody have a question that you could raise your hand or put into the chat right away? Uh, please do. I'll give you a minute here. Um, okay. Well, well, we'll come back to you if we have questions regarding the overall picture, Maxine. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Gord Baird uh, to speak to us in general about the uh, background that you would should consider in, in planning a system for rainwater storage or, or storage in general of any kind. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, David. And um, I'm just, uh, before I start, I'm just gonna answer uh, Patty's question about where does, I think I saw something about where does uh, water delivery come from on the island? And even though I don't live in the island, um, there is a Ronan who is on the island, uh, Salt Spring Island water 
And uh, anyways, Ronan services uh, many of the customers I have on the island that um, don't quite get through a dry season with their rainwater system. So you do have a you do have a certified rainwater bulk water delivery person on on Salt Spring Island. So there, how I started with actually rather than introducing myself, <laughs> introducing a <laughs> Ronan. <laughs> um, so thanks for inviting me. Um, I, for uh, to, I mean, I, I, I scan through and I see a few uh, a few faces and a few names that I, I know already. Um, and Salt Spring is near and dear to my heart because my wife used to live on Wise Island, uh, but she used to work at the food co-op in Salt Spring, and that's where I met her. And and uh, so, I my my love life starts in Salt Spring. Um, I am going to begin by sharing my screen, and um, so let's give this a shot here. And David. You let me know when my screen comes up for you. It, you've got it going great. Wonderful. So I'm going to start by just giving you some resources. Before I even start talking, I'm going to give you two resources that are excellent resources for non-potable water reuse. And one of them is recently done by, um, by uh, SWIPA, and it is the Non-Potable Rainwater Harvesting Guide. And the other one is the Regional District and Nanaimo's Rainwater Harvesting Guide. So just before I even begin, these are two resources that you can look up online and gain access to, and, and they're excellent. Um, moving along, th th there's many key considerations in planning for harvesting your rainwater. And so what I'm going to touch base on in the first 10 minutes are some of these key considerations, and that's going to include, you know, what is your what is your intended use? Is it for potable? Is it for irrigation? Is it for toilet flushing? Um, these are all options that you can use rainwater for. Uh, another key consideration is, is what is your source water? Is it um, is your source water off your roof? Is it off, uh, is, it, is it from the ground? Is it from around the foundation? Uh, and then not to be a bummer, but are there rules that, that you have to think about? So I'm going to touch a base about some of those rules because those rules can be uh, more stringent for some uses and less stringent for other uses. How much do you need? I'll touch on that. And if you are setting up a system and you run out, um, what is your backup? And I and I I think I just sort of cover that, but um, I might expand on that a little bit more as I as I move through. So starting with um, starting with what is your end use? So there are, I'm going to say there's there's potable water end use, which is water that's going to be used in your sinks and showers. And there's going to be non potable water reuse. And I'm going to break that down at a high level into non potable water for indoor use and non potable water for outdoor use. Um, so starting with potable water, uh, potable water, uh, obviously, it's got the highest risk. So we're going to have the most uh, most rules around it. And we also have to be really stringent as to what we collect that potable water on and how we store it and how we pump it and how, how we filter it and treat it and disinfect it. With indoor potable water use, such as laundry and toilets, um, we don't have to be quite so critical about it, but still we wanna pay a fair bit of attention to it because there is some risk to it. And then the other end use is going to be irrigation. And irrigation, for the most part, is low risk. There are some exceptions. But irrigation allows the most flexibility. It's likely the easiest one for the people to install themselves. Um, grants discussion on ponds is going to be really uh, tie into irrigation use wonderfully because irrigation uses a lot more of our water than our potable use of water. But just because rainwater falls from the sky doesn't necessarily mean that it's clean. And we've had enough smoky summers around here that we sort of pray for the first uh, rainfall to help rinse the smoke out of the sky. And so water is, uh, it is great for cleansing the things that need to be cleansed. And we have to keep in mind and, and be considerate of the fact that we need to, um, we need to, we need to be aware of, of our, of our rainwater and where it comes from and what it's cleaning. 
So moving on to source water, uh, we've heard a little bit about groundwater and wells, and we've heard a little bit about you know the stormwater runoff. When it comes to rainwater harvesting, uh, some of the sources of our water are going to be on the roofs of our, our buildings. So those are going to be roof areas that uh, don't have um, access to, of people other than probably cleaning and stuff like that. There's stormwater, and that's the stormwater that's going to run across patios, decks, driveways, lawns. Uh, stormwater is able to be used for a variety of things, though it's going to have more contaminants. It's going to have potential for higher salts. It's going to have hydrocarbons potentially from cars. Um, it's going to have just a, a whole host of different things. So stormwater is able to be used for some non-potable uh, uses, but it's going to limit what your, what your end use is going to be. And another thing that a lot of people don't think about uh, is foundation water. And there are a couple developments going on in Salt Spring Island that do have a little bit of excess water around their foundation. And so there's the potential of thinking about, okay, if I have to get rid of this water around my basement, how am I going to do it? Can I utilize it? Can I, can I recharge the ground, the groundwater with it? Or can I use it for toilet flushing or whatever? So there's many different ways that you can look at source water and store in it. But no matter what we do, we have to look at what the potential contaminants are. And I just talked about air shed uh, and summer smoke, or if you're in the north part of Salt Spring, you could have sometimes the mill uh, impacts the air shed. The materials and chemicals that are on your roofing systems, um, even the things such as your present and future land use that's around you. And I really quickly, I've got a client out in Shirley, two clients out in Shirley. And it's beautiful out there. It's forested, and rainwater makes sense. They uh, they have wells that are a thousand feet deep and produce a gallon a minute. So rainwater is their main use of water. But unfortunately, right next door, forestry lands uh, that are being logged, they're using herbicides to uh, impact the, uh, the the regrowth of the forest. So despite um, despite what looks to be a really nice area there are some potential impacts from the land use beside you. And uh, those who have collected rainwater, uh, there are seasonal impacts. Uh, one of the most common ones is gonna be pollen. And you certainly can mitigate and control for pollen, but you have to realize there's gonna be seasonal impacts. And, um, and no matter what you do, uh, whatever your source water is, is, this, is, it in, is it fit for your intended end use? The other thing that you're going to have to potentially look at are uh, if you are looking at a rainwater system, what are going to be the regulations? What are going to be the rules? And there's going to be, you know, if you're if you've got a house that's got two or more connections, then that's going to be potentially going to be falling under the Drinking Water Protection Act and direct drinking water protection regulation. Single family houses don't need to worry about that, but you will need to understand the BC Plumbing Code and the Building Code. And, um, and you've also got some local bylaws that you need to pay attention to. So if you're doing a rainwater system, the CRD does have a, a bylaw 3780, which is their building bylaw. And it does stipulate some of the requirements they wanna see around rainwater. And um, as Maxine noted, the, there, is, um, there is a bylaw 512, which um, is about uh, the seasonal cottages becoming long-term rentals. And uh, it's got some stipulations about rainwater and what they want to see as a design. And you also have uh, bylaw 418, which is your soil removal and uh, soil deposit removal bylaw, which I think Grant may may touch upon. But yes, there are there are uh, rules. Um, but one of the things that's really nice is that well, it's it's nice for me uh, and anybody that's doing designing of rainwater systems is is back in 2018, the uh, the U.S. and Canada for the very first time developed a standard, a rainwater harvesting standard that is really a guidebook for what you wanna do for different types of uh, harvesting systems and storage systems. And it's something which um, if you do gain access to it, you can buy a CSA standard. Who wants to buy a CSA standard? But um, it actually is interesting. Maybe I'm just a geek. But uh, anyways, it's really useful. And if you're, at least if you're thinking about a potable water system, I would definitely say to invest in it. Um, 
And if you're designing a system or if you're having a professional design a system, the professional, whether it's an engineer or a, um, a certified rainwater designer installer uh, or a geoscientist, they are going to be legally bound to follow this. Uh, really quickly, how much do you need? And we saw a graph that Maxine put up that sort of showed the uh, the monthly rainfall and how it dipped down during the summer and then built back up. I, I'm just going to point to a couple really quick points here. At the very bottom, if you are designing a system for your potable needs, the average person on Salt Spring that's water conscious is going to use about 150 liters per person per day. The, the BC average is, is, is about 272. It has been as high as 300. But for that, you're gonna need about 71 square meters of collection area per person based on our rainfall patterns. And, and these are useful numbers just to jot down a note. And if you're gonna store water, you're gonna need about 15,000 liters of storage. That's about 3,300 gallons, uh, imperial gallons or 4,000 US gallons per person. So this is uh, this node at the bottom is worthwhile and this will be shared with David so that people have access to it. Um, when it comes to irrigation, irrigation does use a lot of water. And if you are utilizing good practices with your irrigation, uh, you're gonna use about 25 millimeters per square meter a week. So every, if you think about a square meter of your garden, you're gonna use about 25 liters of water on that a week. And if you're doing average uh, irrigation practices, it's going to double. It's going to be about 50 liters of water per square meter. So anything you can do to conserve water by mulches, higher organic carbons, and things like that in your soil is, is certainly uh, a consideration. Um, I am going to bypass this, but I'm going to say that if you're wanting to figure out how much storage you're going to need and how much water you can collect. It's really simple to go online now and do a search for rainwater harvesting calculators. Uh, there are hundreds of rainwater harvesting calculators out there and very simply you can search for them and use them and find which one fits best with what your skill level is and how much detail you want to put on. But it, these calculators will basically run you through the process that you see up on the screen. Uh, and it will also run you through a rainwater budget. And a rainwater budget is basically going to have certain things like uh, the rainfall, which you're going to see underneath this blue line. It's going to show you what your storage cisterns are doing or your pond is doing. It's going to show you how much overflow you're getting or how much potential water is not being collected. And it might even show you when you need to top up your water. Uh, with a water delivery to meet your, your needs. So those are sorts of things that um, are really easily accessible online from simple searches. And I am going to cut there and stop screen sharing. Um, and I'm going to open it up to some questions because there's a lot of information on a short period of time. I wasn't keeping track of my time. Um, shoot me some questions. I'm, I'm happy to take them. I'll start it off with uh, from William Shulba in the chat. Did you see that? Can you are you monitoring your chat or? I or? am. I'm just bringing it up right now. Uh, it says, uh, "Can rainwater harvesting systems be approved, Island Health, for multifamily housing as a primary supply? If so, what is the minimum daily water storage requirement per capita, and how many days of storage is needed to be constructed to endure summer dry months?" Okay, so I'm. It's actually it sounds like a complicated question, but the answer is really easy. Is uh, as of uh, as of this past summer, uh, the standard that I brought up does cover uh, rainwater harvesting for uh, multifamily residential buildings and commercial buildings and single-family residential buildings. And then this past summer, the province uh, brought their guidelines out to mesh the CSA standard, which does cover multifamily and it does cover commercial buildings. So yes, the answer is yes, you can do rainwater harvesting for multifamily residential units as a primary source. 
um, the sizing is going to be determined by the professional that's doing the design. Likely the design is gonna be for more than 150 liters uh, per person per day. And generally, because we have three months of drought, you're gonna see that storage is gonna cover about three months of drought plus a buffer of about 15% additional. So hopefully that answers that question. Uh, another question is, uh, what is the, what is the pollen, in what way is pollen a contaminant? Pollen makes a beautiful, beautiful goo. And the best way to explain this is that if you've got a car and the wind blows and the, the dug fir and all your, uh, your trees let the pollen out and the rains come uh, on a very heavy pollen flow, your windshield wipers will not wipe the pollen off. So you do need to do one of many different ways to address the pollen. And, um, and there certainly are ways of doing that so that you don't have to uh, gum up your tanks and pumps and filters. Um, and the chat is going busy here, so I might miss a few, David, yeah. but, uh, well, I was just going to suggest too, that, uh, I, you notice if, if people are seeing their screen, they may notice that I've raised my hand. Uh, so, so that's the way people can also get their questions out. So if we run into too many on the chat, we won't be able to handle it. So raise your hand if you're, uh, if you're keen to get your question answered right now. We will have an opportunity at the end as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, and there was one question, but do you have a recommended filter system? Maybe we leave that to the end there. Uh, we'll, leave, we'll leave that to the end, absolutely. Cause I'll touch base about filters in the next, uh, in the next set when I talk about the basic elements. Okay. Um, and what kind of contaminants come off of an asphalt shingle roof? Um, I will touch base on that on my next presentation. Um, and could you explain what the building code is currently for gutter downspouts and does it go into perforated pipes around the house? Um, with uh, right now, if you do not have a rainwater harvesting, uh, your rainwater collection is going to be coming into its very own non perforated pipe uh, and then drain away at your house. And then there's going to be perforated pipes, which are going to be able to collect uh, the groundwater that's around your house that um, will also drain away in its own drainage system. So you're going to have two drainage systems uh, under the present building code. So you can't combine um, you can't combine the two, but um, or you can't have one single pipe. So there is uh, some aspects of the building and plumbing code that um, that account for that. Um, any chance of government rebates? That is where uh, the best I've seen is local governments. And we're starting to see local governments uh, stepping in and providing uh, grants and rebates. Uh, the city of Victoria has their rainwater rewards program where they cover a certain portion of uh, tank costs or rebate some of the design costs. Uh, the regional district of Nanaimo has uh, rebates. Um, so the things to, to keep in mind, um, and definitely reach out and, and either speak to Islands Trust or speak to the CRD. Probably Islands Trust would be the, the one that would be most likely to in, have a, a list of rebates that they might be able to offer, or at least you can lobby them to, to put rebates there. And I think that one of those rebates was brought up earlier on uh, by, um, actually, I think David brought it up. Uh, if there's any other questions out there, David, feel free to ask me. Um, I think I may have missed a few in the chat. Here's one, how does Crofton Mill contaminate the air shed? So um, now Crofton Mill, um, sometimes, sometimes Crofton Mill is a little bit stinky. And, uh, but generally Crofton Mill is, mills have gotten better, but if, in short, if you can smell something in the air, then there's something to be measured. And um, so that is the way that I would look at it. If, if I was designing a, a water system for potable use uh, on the north end of Salt Spring, um, what I'd be doing is I'd be taking a water sample and getting it tested. And then my filtration system would be designed to mitigate anything that is being collected in the air shed. Um, whether that is potential some sulfur compounds or things like that. So those are things that would show up in the water sampling. 
this this issue of rebates, I think, is a really important one. And I, I wondered if Maxine, if you could unmute and tell us a little bit about the CRD program that you're aware of. Uh, I, I don't know too much about it. I think that uh, transitions. Oh, well, there's a community group on Salt Spring that is in the process of, of creating a, a mechanism for a rebate program. So people should keep their eye on the news about this. And yeah. certainly uh, yeah. I, I noticed from, from Aaron Ann that uh, Transition Salt Spring is starting an educational program that's soon coaching folks on, on, on working on incentives and rebates. It's something we need here because we have such a difficult water problem it's it really would be beneficial to the community as a whole to have a rebate program so some of the viewers out there i'm sure can get involved with this and help transition salt spring get that rebate program going uh, if, if you ready to volunteer so i'll call I'll, for that I'll just, yeah i'll just say we just got our first funding boost we've been uh, doing lots of fundraising we just got our first yes so we're going to start slowly and hopefully increase that program as funds come in Great, and I bet you always could use more help with uh, working on that project too, Erin Ann. Yeah. Okay, um, well, I think this is a good time to move on to the next topic and we'll come back to some of the questions, but uh, I'd like to introduce now uh, Grant Wicklin, uh, the, uh, our pond expert among other things, uh, and uh, looking forward to hearing uh, about the solutions that come about through ponds, if if we can manage them. So Grant, can you take over now? Certainly. Uh, thank you to all uh, for showing up for this. I have built a, a few ponds, uh, some on slopes, some would be really not allowed now. Um, but I thought with the time I've had, uh, we've gardened for 45 years. And so we always are looking for a water supply that isn't from a well. Um, so to begin, I, I thought I'd, I'd define what I mean by a pond. Um, people have all sorts of visual images of ponds they've seen. I think of a pond as uh, usually on an acreage uh, 12 to 20 feet deep for oxygen and cold water at the bottom, uh, anywhere between a half to a million gallons, imperial gallons of water is nice for irrigation and also for firefighting in our forest because we need more water supplies and in all of the situations we've had, I've always had a hookup for the pump truck two and a half inch coarse thread. They can draw uh, as much as they need and closer to the fire usually than their own sources. So that's how I think of ponds. They're big, they're swimmable. You can put fish in them with a permit, um, but you have to locate them. And uh, you can't just put a pond anywhere. There's lots of dry holes on this island, uh, a testament to the, the really restricted number of places you can put a pond. Uh, if you're sinking up to your ankles on your flat ground and there's skunk cabbage next to you, chances are good you could do a pond there. Uh, having alders that are falling over in all directions and are quite large in diameter, also a good indication. Uh, under the current rules, you want to look for ground that isn't a steep slope. In fact, a one in 10 foot grade two level is about ideal, um, simply because you cannot build berms 12 feet high anymore uh, without an extensive engineering. Um, part of our uh, focus has always been to make a, an economical pond that's affordable uh, instead of something that is highly engineered. Um, if you do have such a wet spot on your property and it looks like it could accommodate a pond, if it's 100 by 100 feet, that would be good. Uh, you want to dig a test hole with an excavator that can go down 20 feet and see what's down there. Uh, just on the face of it, when you start, you're going to go through a layer of uh, soil. Uh, then, generally speaking, you hit a layer of 
uh, gray clay, uh, very hard, like a hard pan, is known as glacial till. And then underneath that, if you are on a good spot, you hit blue clay, which can feel like it's bottomless. And sometimes the excavator may uh, experience it as bottomless by sinking out of sight. Uh, this has happened. Um, so if you dig a test hole, you want to fence it. And it's a good idea to put an extension ladder so that anyone who inadvertently falls in can climb out. It's also extremely handy for measuring for the dry season at least where the water level goes over the course of the ground drying out. So it gives you a hint about what your pond level would be uh, later on. Um, once you are convinced that you have pond ground, then uh, you generally are going to be clearing it all. Uh, you want to conserve all of the topsoil very carefully and make a first cut and a separate pile that's accessible in the areas where you're going to end up constructing a berm, which is always on the downhill side. Uh, so first cut of topsoil, second cut of the subsoil is very useful on the outskirts of a berm to, uh, to build the ground up um, and to even out the slope and make it so that it's usable. Uh, after that, you're into hard pan, uh, glacial till, that sort of thing. And this is when timing and the moistness of the clay becomes critical because you're going to be digging the pretty much the basic entire footprint, including the footprint of the berm that, su that supports the pond. You're gonna be digging that down to clay because as you dig the pond location out, you're moving material onto the clay so that you're building clay on clay. And it's critical for a pond not to just leak away that this is done properly. Generally in a larger pond, you'd want to use two machines, uh, a large like 160 or 200 class or greater uh, for digging the clay out. And then a machine that with treads to pack that clay in one foot high lifts. So it's just, you know, just about a foot at a time. And you want to knead the clay body back together so that it is, it's like uh, making uh, clay bread, essentially. You're, you're putting the clay back together so that there aren't channels in it. There's not air entrainment in it. It's kneaded back together. The key way of knowing that this is working well is that if you follow the excavator as it's moving across the clay that you're packing, the ground from the weight of the excavator will sink and then it will rise up as the excavator passes and you can see the ground moving up and down. There's a very good indicator that you're getting cohesion in the clay. It's not too technical. It's actually quite a bit of fun. Um, you don't really want a slope more than three to one on anything that you build, either in the pond side or on the outside of the pond. It's, uh, a three foot run with a one foot rise pretty much the maximum slope uh, or the minimum, I must say, and uh, that you want. And you do need uh, a surface uh, at the top. It can be, you know, 10 or 12 feet. That's level. Um, it's, uh, the current rules, if you go higher than four feet on the downhill side above the original grade, you're going to be into engineering with someone like Rysak and Andrew Jackson, or uh, there are others I'm sure who are quite capable and given good in information and good suggestions on how to proceed. But if you think of four feet as the limit, it helps define your site. And it also tells you that you're probably gonna have about 30 or 40 feet of footprint in width that goes around the downhill side of the pond. Uh, you can use a steeper slope within the original undisturbed clay under a pond. You can go almost a one-to-one, -one, a 45 degree angle, uh, because that ground is not only undisturbed, but it has the support of the water once the pond fills in the first winter. Uh, 
so that can give you more volume. Uh, we like to go, we originally started with 12 feet, but uh, a weedy pond is not quite as much fun as a deep pond with clear water. And we like to swim, so 20 feet is great. Uh, I think the record on Salt Springs 43 feet, but uh, I think that would just be because the fellow who did it was quite focused. Uh, he knew there was water down there somewhere. He kept digging till he found it and he ended up with a 43 foot deep pond. Uh, if you, there are all sorts of things that can arise that your wonderful excavator operator, who's usually probably 70 years old by now, uh, like the rest of us, um, they are the real master technicians of all of this. And um, the, the credit for the successful ponds goes to them. Choosing the right spot really helps. Having a competent professional on the machines really makes a huge difference. Um, you may have enough water coming out of the ground that you need to uh, essentially retain the bank on the uphill side. If you've got uh, a lot of water coming, you may need to rip wrap it. There is a technical thing. You will need advice from a professional on that. Uh, you need to have, with our current projections of massive amounts of rain at once, you need to have a swale that allows a major flow of water in to get out. So a swale is a wide lower portion that hopefully can traverse not on ground you've built up, but on undisturbed ground at the side. It's good to try and put it on the, the other side away from where any major flow is coming in. Uh, you may have a culvert or uh, generally not a creek, but there's, there's seasonal water that flows all over the place that isn't defined as a creek. Um, it's good to have cross flow in the pond. It helps kind of move things along. Um, you also need a, just below that overflow of a four to six inch trickle pipe to just take care of water that's coming on a daily basis all the time and it's not a massive flow. And a trickle pipe basically is a TN pipe that allows water to come rise up in the pipe and flow out uh, and fall far enough away that it isn't going to cut any ground that you fill. Uh, it's very good to install a ramp down to a float so that you have access and a safe way of getting out of the pond should you fall in. It's also great for mounting pumps for your irrigation system. Uh, as of uh, this 2016, you, if you're gonna use the water for non-domestic uses, uh, that would be a garden greater than a quarter acre, uh, you need a water license from the province. And you have until March, 2022 to get that water license with uh, some benefits um, being first in line for the water you're using, that sort of thing. It's also possible to get a, a trout permit for the pond. Trout do a wonderful job of not only keeping down mosquito larvae, but also keeping the pond clean. Um, you, there's also sometimes a potential for some wild cutthroat trout. Uh, it's good after everything is built to respread the soil. Um, we like to plant on the downhill side of the pond, uh, things like uh, walnut trees that really love that water source. The pond will leak, all ponds leak. It just doesn't need to leak a lot. And if we had 40 ponds on every watershed on Salt Spring, we would have running creeks all summer. So that's a about it for me. Thank you. That's that's great, Grant. And uh, actually, as a pond owner ourselves, De Deborah and I have a pond on our property. I wish we had had your wisdom uh, provided to us before we we got our pond. Uh, I'm sure we could have <laughs> used some of your great wisdom to uh, make it better. But. Um, I, there's some questions coming in through the chat, and so we'll just fire those off at you. Um, uh, can, uh, 
there are people there are quite a number of people that are interested in ponds so that's really terrific um people are asking if you have advice for cleaning the water of an older existing large pond from algae and pond plants really the only thing you can do i've seen quite a few of these uh, they get choked only because they're too shallow and the the fix is that in the fall when water level is the lowest you bite the bullet you pump out the pond you go in with an excavator and clean it out and it's a messy business and try as much as you can if uh, if you can make the pond you know if it's eight feet make it six feet deeper uh, it's always tricky knowing what to do with all the material but it really helps uh, with water sources for them to not have a lot of organics in them uh, there will be uh, there will be uh, like um, all sorts of plant, water plants that arrive in a pond, not all of them spread. And uh, it, it, it will die, the plants will help clean the water too. Fish are also very good, trout are good. What about, someone's asking whether, what are your thoughts about diatomaceous earth as a bottom dressing? Have you tried that or do you have experience with that? I, I know nothing about it. I, I, Another, I, I wouldn't think it would be a, too cost effective, but. but yeah, I, I, uh, I wonder too, it's a kind of interesting material for sure. <laughs> That's uh, for sure. And people have talked about um, uh, a type of uh, material that's used in fighting firefighting that uh, does cl close cracks and so forth it, when added to ponds. That's what I've heard, but I don't know anything about that myself. You haven't heard of that. Um, well, I, you shouldn't that. really, you shouldn't pardon me. You shouldn't be really getting cracks in the pond uh, when you've kneaded all the clay back together. Where the clay is wet, which is where it's working, which is underwater, it's going to be totally saturated. Right. Um, someone suggested fish for the algae. Uh, as a biologist who built the pond primarily for the specimens that were in it uh, <laughs> decided not to use fish because we wanted the, all the other things. But yeah, there's all kinds of yeah. things. Someone's asking about a swimming pool. Can a swimming be, pool be turned into a catchment, a, a water catchment? Swimming pools are tricky because they're just totally wonderful for growing algae. And I'm not even sure what you'd have to do uh, to get it to work properly. It, they really are complex systems ponds. And, and part of that complexity is the plants that grow in the, I, I think you need soil. And most people don't want to put two feet of soil in their swimming pool to see what happens. So I, I don't have a good answer for it. Let's put it that way. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, hey, I think a swimming pool, if you're not going to swim in it, a little soil might help. Uh, <laughs> it's some biology in there. Uh, yeah. Kate McEwen is asking uh, about uh, your estimated costs for a, a pool that, uh, for a pond that's say 100 by 120 feet deep. Do you know what it would cost to dig that kind of thing? Does it depend on the, the location? Well, there's a huge, yeah, there's a huge number of variables, but in our experience, we've we've usually spent between ten and twenty thousand dollars on machine time. Uh, not that you can haul soil anymore or clay, but if you have a totally in ground pond and you want to have you know between a half and a million gallons in that size that we're talking about here, you're going to have two hundred and fifty to three hundred tandem truckloads of clay. Now someone will notice uh, because moving soil in that quantity there's there's reasons have been found why that shouldn't happen without a permit so uh i would what i would like to see if this is truly supported by the community and the trust is a way of distributing clay to people who want to build ponds but don't have quite the right soil type and want to do a pond liner we unloaded, uh, I mean, gave uh, uh, 
250 truckloads uh, to a person who had a very leaky pond and he fixed his pond and he paid for the trucking, which I really liked. So uh, it is a problem sometimes if you're all in ground, you've got a lot of material to be, be to deal with, you know, and your truck can only carry 10 cubic meters. So if you've got a lot more than that, you, you have to think of something. You end up terraforming your property otherwise, you know. Right, and, right. Anyway. Uh, just before we go back to Gord for the final uh, session here, I, I, there was a question about uh, aeration. Could you speak to uh, aeration of ponds? Yes. The, the, if you have a culvert flow coming your way across your property, that our property on the south end right now has a 12 inch culvert, it's very bountiful in the winter. Um, what you want to do with that is catch it in a, in a, a concrete box in the ditch that it's running through and pipe it so that it falls about four feet into the pond surface. Now, and a four feet fall is sufficient to aerate the water. And uh, if you want to know how you're doing, if you need to supplement with a pumping system that makes a, uh, a basically a fountain in the pond, you, Kathy Reimer has a um, biological oxygen meter for water, which she checks if she's, you know, looking for a place to put fish. So, uh, but having, just having water fall, the source water fall into the pond four feet is sufficient. Uh, great, that's a really interesting uh, approach to it, Grant, and, and I didn't know that, so we've got to find a way to get a little waterfall going at our place. Um, I'm going to, there's more questions, but I'm going to move on now. Uh, and for the specific questions, I, I hope people will get a hold of you later uh, to, to ask some things that are very pond oriented. So certainly. Okay. Happy to um, do so, so we're going to finish off uh, our presentations, having a presentation from Gord again, uh, to talk specifically about water, rainwater harvesting and catchment in, for, in containers. Uh, so turn it over to, uh, Gord now. Thanks. Thanks, Grant. Aaron, uh, Aaron Ann, are you with us? I, I, we're not getting Gord right now. We cannot hear him. Can you, can we, uh, there how's that sound it's a bit better I was, I, I was beginning to think that the, that you guys didn't want to listen to me so you just put me on a, a perma, permanent mute <laughs> wonderful david I, I the questions that are coming up um are are all excellent so what i'm going to do is the next segment is i'm going to run through it and um and i'm probably going to run run through it a little bit quicker in order to open it up to the questions because i think the questions are really valuable so I'm going to start by sharing my screen again, and and David, let me know if the screen comes up again. Yeah, you're you're good. I'm good. Okay. Oh, and my screen just went black. It, it did that. Oh. Yes. <laughs> okay. How's that? Can you see it? Not so far. Not well, so far. Maybe a delay in, uh, we've seen this kind of thing before. I am going to just uh, resume share. There it is. Now we have it. Wonderful. Now we have it. OK. So um, with regards to a rainwater harvesting system, there's sort of s several basic elements. and. Um, so those elements are gonna include, um, I will start back here a little bit. It's gonna start with your collection area and your roof. And someone did ask about materials. Um, the materials that are on your roof, uh, it's more important to pay close attention to the materials when you're dealing with a potable system and less so on a non-potable system. But someone did ask about uh, asphalt shingles and asphalt shingles as a potable system, 
I don't recommend it because they can have fire retardants on them and they can have what are called poly aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs. And really that's not something that I choose to buy at the grocery store to drink. So I'm not going to collect it and put it in my water storage system. Um, when it comes from your roof to your tanks, what you wanna try and do is you wanna try and filter out the fine debris such as pollen and you wanna filter out the coarse debris such as pine needles and leaves and other items. And you also wanna make sure that the segment from your roof to your tanks is sealed so that <clears throat> things can't get into your tank. Um, your tank makes a really nice swimming pool and we don't want it to be a swimming pool and we wanna keep things like frogs and slugs, snakes, birds, uh, mosquitoes and those sorts of things. So anything coming into your tank needs to be completely sealed from access to things that you don't want in there. And the same thing when it comes to the overflow. Uh, the tank itself, um, I generally put aeration in my tank and it's not that the aerator is putting oxygen into the tank, but the aerator is causing the water in the tank to turn over. And most of the oxygenation is gonna happen on the top surface where the water at the top of the tank meets the air in the top cavity of the tank. Um, and um, the, uh, the other thing about storage tanks is that all storage tanks, uh, whether they're gonna be uh, HDPE or metal or concrete, they all have a biofilm on them and uh, they all have a, a little bit of sediment in the bottom of them. And a lot of people <clears throat> in the past were really scared of the biofilm and the sediment in the bottom, but that is biology in the tank that's actually working to help clean the water. So as long as your sediment in your tank <clears throat> is under a centimeter deep and you're not collecting excess sediment, that is uh, some good anaerobic uh, biology in the bottom of the tank that's doing some cleaning and then the biofilm that's on the sides of the tank is also doing some cleaning so don't be too scared of it uh, we've got a tank system that is 15 years old and uh, we still can see the plastic in the bottom uh, and we see a little bit of sediment so we're not collecting a lot of sediment and that's coming off of a living roof in our in our case um, and then there's uh, the filtration and the pumping of your tank uh, or your water system afterwards. And depending on what your end use is going to be, and depending on what your how clean your water is and your storage system is going to be, that will determine the type of pump that you're using, and it will determine the type of filtration that you're using. And so with roof materials, generally things like uh, metal roofs, clay tiles, slate, solar panels, those are all really, really good for, um, for catchment materials. Uh, they are all gonna collect uh, bits and pieces on them. And you do have to think about um, rinsing off those in the, the potential bird poo or pollen that might uh, be collecting on them in the first initial flush. So generally when you have a roofing system, you're not gonna collect 100% of what lands in your roof. You wanna basically waste about 10% of the water that lands on your roof. Uh, and so when you're thinking about roof collection, you have to think about collecting, you know, 85 to 90% of the water that lands in your roof. And uh, cause if you try and collect it all, you're gonna be collecting the dirtiest water that lands on it. And again, it's, uh, it's important uh, for potable systems to use things that are, um, in the, that CSA standard I pulled up that are allowed for potable water systems. Uh, catchment, um, the size will determine how much you can catch. Uh, obviously precipitation, the materials, site vegetation and surrounding land use, which I talked about a little bit earlier in the previous uh, segment. And, um, and I kind of covered this when I talked about the, the conveyance from the roof to the tanks, but to, um, Something that uh, many people don't think about is people think that a, a plastic pipe is a plastic pipe. And, um, but that's not quite true. Uh, a potable water PVC pipe is a potable water certified pipe and a sewage pipe um, up until not too long ago, they were extruded with uh, lead dyes. And so a lot of people used sewer pipes because it was cheaper than buying potable water PVC pipe to move water, but really what they were doing is they were buying pipe that was not meant for potable and it was leaching lead into their water systems. 
and uh, I talked about sealing the water coming in and the water overflowing against vermin. Um, I talked about pre-filtration. And there is the, the two references I started the first segment with, the, uh, the one from Salt Spring and the one from the Regional District of Nanaimo. Uh, they have got great information with regards to design concepts that people can reference. And, and those, uh, those references are free online. Um, I am going to move through this slide because I hadn't expected to see this slide in there. This is from a prior presentation, but these are just a couple pictures of some simple first flush diverters and coarse debris filters for leaves. And that is what pollen looks like when you wipe your windshield. Uh, this is a series of tanks going in out in Shirley. Um, those are 5,000 gallon tanks, so there's 10,000 gallons of storage. Uh, the tanks, one of the things that you'll see is that the water that will be coming from the roofs will be going into the top. There'll be a first flush diverter right here that will collect the first little bit of rainfall in a four inch pipe and it slowly drains away to a drain. And any other water that goes through has to go through a filter before it goes into the tank. My tanks are in place. Anytime that your tanks, you have uh, two or more tanks connected and it's kind of hard to see it here but you wanna make sure that there's a flexible, uh, flexible joins between the tanks. Tanks will settle over time, no matter how much we try and uh, adjust for that, but we have to allow for a flexible joints between tanks. Otherwise, these will snap and you will lose your water. Uh, this is a very small system going into a public park. Again, it's a really small first flush diverter right here. When this first flush diverter fills up with water, then the water continues on into the um, into the coarse debris filter, and then we have a tank overflow. Everything that leaves a tank, um, it is protected from things that can crawl back up by way of a backwater valve. And in this case here, we have otters on this island, and the otters would love to come up and crawl into the tank. So we have a, a basically a backwater valve that is downstream of any of the drains that we have. And so critters can't get in from the top because we've got this unit here. They also cannot get in from the top because we have gutter guards up in the gutters and they can't get in from the overflow because we have a backwater valve. So those are some pretty critical components of the storage system. Um, I will move on through, talk a little bit about storage. So it's pretty common. Most people are aware of the uh, of the HDPE or the poly tanks. They are the other than a pond. The pond is going to be the lowest price storage system and the the most cost effective storage system out there. So Grant has got all these beat hands down with ponds. But if you don't have a pond and you need to do storage, uh, poly tanks are going to be your next bet. Um, Poly tanks, they don't need a concrete base. They can just be on a uh, compacted uh, fill sand or compacted road base. And, uh, but you do want to keep them cool. So they need to be shaded. Uh, a big black tank um, is going to heat up. And, and the warmer that your water is, the more life that's going to grow into it. I, love, I like concrete tanks. Uh, they are more expensive. And um, they can be buried. But uh, if you do bury a concrete tank, uh, you have to remember that concrete sailboats float and so do concrete tanks. So even if you've got a concrete tank that is 28,000 um, pounds, if the groundwater comes up, it's gonna pop up. So you have to make sure that if you do bury a concrete tank that you've uh, calculated for the buoyancy factor and you have to either make sure that it's weighted down or strapped down or that wherever it's buried, it's trench so water can drain through and it, and it could never float. One of the things that I have seen is um, concrete tanks, and this is a, an example, mostly concrete tanks are placed on top of pea gravel and pea gravel is sort of the round pebbles. Don't place a concrete tank on compacted road base. And, uh, and the reason why is that compacted road base doesn't self level and if it shifts, uh, these tanks here, they were installed before I got involved in the project. There's a, a series of these tanks in place and the, con 
the road base had been put down, was beautifully level, was compacted, these tanks went in, uh, and then these tanks cracked, and all all the tanks cracked from this point up here, where the over where the upper uh, outlet is, to the drain port. And so we have all these very expensive tanks cracked. So we had to adjust and repair all these tanks. Use pea gravel if you're using uh, concrete tanks. Otherwise, you're going to have um, very you're going to have some issues. If you're dealing concrete tanks and you're using a potable water system, you can buy a Zypex sealer from any hardware store and it is potable water certified. So you can seal these concrete tanks with a potable sealer. The concrete tanks themselves aren't necessarily potable unless you've bought them that way from the manufacturer. Because what happens is when they use the forms to to do the form work in a regular concrete tank is they've used uh, they've used basically a, an oil spray to uh, coat their forms so they can take it apart. Uh, if you specifically order concrete tanks as a potable water tank, they will not use the form oil. They'll actually coat their forms with um, with basically plastic sheeting. But if uh, that being said, you can always put it the Zypax on there. Metal tanks are great. They can stay cooler. They're strong. Um, and, uh, and I know that Sander Ungerson on the island had worked with the CRD on this. Uh, but right now in the CRD, if you're doing a, a, a metal tank that is 30,000 gallons or smaller, you don't need to have a concrete base. You can have a, uh, you can have a, a compacted road, uh, road base as your platform for them. But if you're going bigger than that, then you are starting to get into some seismic engineering and things like that. If you have a house and you've got a crawl space, there are bladder tanks or rainwater pillows that you can use. Um, I've never used them, um, but they are a potential for getting water into areas and under decks that might not otherwise be able to be used for uh, storage. And these have been used since uh, actually the Vietnam War. So they've got a long history for holding fuels in them. And now they make them out of potable materials and used specifically for potable water systems. The big critical takeaway with uh, doing a, a, a pillow is you have to make sure that the surface that the pillow sits on is flat. Because if it is slightly sloped, uh, it's going to do the slinky effect and it's going to uh, navigate its way down to the lowest portion. So you do wanna make sure that if you're using a, a pillow, you've got your road base uh, nice and flat and you've got a tarp there. Ponds, I love ponds. Um, and I'd love to have a clay lime pond, but ours is not a clay lime pond. Um, we're on bedrock. And as much as we've tried to seal it with bentonite and seal it with, uh, many different forms, uh, we couldn't get our clay to seal. Uh, and it was, our clay is two feet thick, but we have some steep slopes next to bedrock that we couldn't seal. So we ended up having to go with a liner. Um, even when we bought our liner, uh, it's still, our liner came in at about seven cents a liter, uh, which is about, I'm gonna say about 20, is about 32 cents a gallon which is still a lot cheaper than buying uh, any other tanking system. And uh, when we're dealing with a, uh, when we're dealing with a liner, we have our liner in place at the very bottom of the liner where the gases or groundwater can swell up underneath the liner. We have a burp valve and it allows things to, uh, to burp. And in the pond liner, uh, we have an anchor trench all the way around the outside edge of the pond where our liners and cushions go into it and get backfilled to, uh, to keep it in place. And this is what it looks like uh, several years afterwards. Um, we love our pond. It is, uh, this is our irrigation pond for our nursery. And um, we have about, it's not a very big pond. It's a 12 feet deep and it's about 80 by 60 feet. Um, so it's a small side for ponds, but it does serve our nursery uh, all year round. It holds about 250,000 liters. Um, I'm not going to go into design drawings. Uh, I will sneak through these slides to see if there's anything quickly that pops up. Uh, this is a design of a system on Salt Spring Island, actually. 
and uh, I'm going to stop my screen. Ah, I'm going to talk about filtration. If you are um, if you are doing irrigation, uh, irrigation requires a different type of a pump than uh, potable water. When you're dealing with irrigation, generally what you're dealing with is you're dealing with having to move a large volume of water without a lot of pressure. And so you're gonna have a particular type of pump to run your irrigation system. When you're dealing with a potable water system and you're having to run it through filters, you're gonna be dealing with a high pressure, but not moving a lot of water. So irrigation might be 25 gallons a minute at 30 PSI, but potable water might be 60, 60 PSI at five gallons or seven gallons a minute. So if you are uh, doing a design and uh, dealing with getting water from your storage system to where it needs to go. It's worthwhile contacting um, one of the local folks on the islands uh, or even uh, one of the folks here on in Victoria just to inquire about the type of pumping that you need because it's one of those things that uh, can potentially be a little bit complicated for some but it shouldn't be anything that you can't do yourself with a little bit of guidance. And I am going to quit sharing my screen and I am going to open up the chat here and take questions because I think that there was just a ton of questions that uh, that had been popping up. Yeah, um, thank you. That's really great, uh, Gord. And uh, the questions I, I'm just looking to by all means, anyone who wants to have a question, we have uh, a little bit of time, maybe 10 minutes to uh, to deal with final questions. And I think it's it's probably worth having everybody uh, on the panel uh, accessible for these questions. So uh, let's just open those two uh, lines up. Um, and uh, I, I know we've got a, a number of comments uh, about pools and swimming pools um does anyone have any specific questions regarding the kind of container systems that gord is talking about so we'll put that out as a question um here's somebody elisa asking about solar pumps for 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 irrigation and i can i can speak a little bit about solar pumps but uh and uh, i do often deal with off-grid systems um, solar pumps, they are expensive, uh, depending on what you're trying to move. And I would say that uh, if you're trying to move a lot of water really quickly with a solar pump, um, it's going to be a more expensive than dealing with a uh, potable water uh, needs with a solar pump. Uh, are the pump that we run out of our deep wells actually a solar pump? And um, so it's, uh, it's, not, it's not unreasonable, but uh, I'm happy uh, if that's uh, the list that I know, feel free to shoot me uh, an email and I can give you a few links. Uh, a question about uh, pH of the water. Is there a need to control the pH uh, in the container? Yes, there is. Um, where we are, and especially along the water, we're dealing with the lower pH. We're dealing with a pH of about 6.4 and that 6.4 is going to corrode pipes. Uh, so generally what I have to do is I have to um, adjust pH either by the filtration system, but what I like to do is I like to buy a bag of uh, calcium carbonate that I get that is used in potable water systems and just dump in a bag into the storage system to help uh, bring up the pH. And it also helps mineralize because rainwater doesn't have very much for minerals on it either. Uh Great, that's that's really interesting. Um, realistically, uh, Gord or anybody, uh, what would be the total cost for a potable system uh, installed for, say, a one-bedroom house with two people? Do you have any ideas? I do. Um, potable systems, uh, because you're dealing with a potable system, and I'll sort of break this down at a high level. Uh, potable system, the design and stamping, you're gonna spend probably about $5,500 just in the design and stamping of a potable system. Um, and then you're gonna spend about a dollar a gallon for storage. And, and usually by the time you're done, 
it's not unreasonable to expect to spend about $35,000 for a small potable system. And the price for a larger potable system really is not gonna be much different other than just increased storage tanks. So uh, the, initial, the initial stuff is gonna be the same for small or large systems with the pumping, the filtration and pre-filtering the water and that sort of stuff. Great. So, so, uh, what about uh, someone asked? How about removing the sediment from the bottom of the tank? How often do you have to do that, and how do you do it? Well, unlike Grant, where you can bring in an excavator and excavate it out of there, um, to, and to be completely honest, I've never had a system where I've had to remove sediment out of a tank. Um, so, if you have sediment that is getting, you know up to two centimeters thick, then it's time to get the sediment out of your tank. But it's also a good sign that your pre-filtration process isn't up to snuff because it's allowing that to build up. Um, if you've got a good pre-filtration, uh, chances are you shouldn't have to worry about sediment for you know, 30, 30 some odd years. If you need to rinse the sediment out, what you need to do is you would need to pump your tank out um, or drain your tank out. Just, and as you're draining your tank, you would need to basically disturb that sediment so that you can uh, bring the sediment up into the water column. And in that way, it's gonna get rid of most of the sediment. And after that, you may want to give it a, a bit of a rinse, but generally, if you've been able to emulsify that sediment into the water column and then drain that water out, you've pretty much got out the most of the sediment that you need to get out. And you've kept a little bit of the biology in the tank to. Uh, to reset itself. Uh, and maybe this is a question for Grant. Um, what about berming? How does you you mentioned uh, that if we did have a lot of ponds here, we would have a, a better water regime on the island? How does that work? How, how does berming and and pond storage in in the stream systems, how does that uh, increase the water supply on the island? Oops, Aaron Ann, or could you unmute? There you go, There Grant. you go. Okay, the ponds leak. You don't want it to leak a lot, but if it's a clay pond, it leaks. And the more ponds you incorporate it into the upstream of the major creeks, the more leaking is going to occur and the more water that is going to be available downstream. It's pretty simple. So we can saturate our, our watersheds if we if we uh, just store it a little longer. That's great. Uh, someone is asking uh, about gray water. What's what are your thoughts about gray water in general? Uh, <laughs> Gord? Well, I, I can speak to that. Um, so I was part of the team that wrote the uh, the provincial regulate the provincial guidelines uh, for gray water and composting toilets. So it is legal in BC as of 2016, and that's not to say that some of the municipalities they have the ability to uh, make uh, bylaws and, and stuff like that that supersede. Uh, the sewage system regulations. But gray water is a potential. But when you think about gray water, um, gray water is something where there's, there's two types. There's light gray water and there's dark gray water. Dark gray water comes from the kitchen sink. Light gray water comes from showers and laundry. And if you're dealing with showers and laundry, it's a simpler, less expensive process. If you're dealing with kitchen sinks, then you almost have to treat it a little bit like, uh, like a septic system where you need to have a tank or some way of uh, knocking down uh, the, the, the BOD uh, in, in the gray water. So it is good. Uh, water conservation is critical. And it's the first thing because tanks are expensive. If you can save water in any way that's possible, that's great. Composting toilets is an excellent way. Uh, we both, I'm not trying to sell a book on composting toilets, but we've written a book on composting toilets. And, um, and it's worthwhile checking into it, but realize that um, there are a host of different options and it's worthwhile to, to do your research and ask some questions and, and reach out to some of the folks that do it to, uh, to help 
guide you in the right direction. We've kind of reached our time, but but I think it's it's right, there's quite a few questions coming in. So if you don't mind, we'll go over a little bit here. Sure. Uh, William was asking uh, Maxine. I don't know if you saw these, Maxine, but what do you think um, as what the biggest challenge on salt spring water resources coming from your long experience on the Water Pre Preservation Society? What do you think is the biggest challenge uh, that that we face that can be solved? Do you have any ideas on that? Wow. <laughs> I don't know. That's, you know, I, I guess I would say that a lot of people don't recognize um, that our water supply is limited. And we should try to get that word out to people because um, it looks like there's a lot of water in those lakes but there really isn't. So that, that, I think that's our biggest challenge that we, could, we need to try to change. Kind of an educational problem really, isn't it? Yeah, thank you, that's great. Um, May I uh, ask a question to our panelists, please? Um, may, prior to, for, if we're in a situation where we are at now without having water catchment or without having storage tanks and things as such, what is it that we can do on our own property now um, in order to uh, conserve water for landscaping? Like how should we be planting our gardens with berms and swales and what are the things that we can do now in order to water our plants that surround our home? I can, I can answer that if I can tell you what my experience is. So there are, there are multiple different things. Uh, definitely, if you've got a little bit of a slope and you've got the ability to have swales and you can slow the water down, sink it in and spread it out, and get it into the ground, that's great. Uh, mulches are great. And we do deep mulches, uh, almost six to eight inches thick, um, even around trees. So we just put it like a little, uh, put a plant pot around the tree so that the mulch isn't against the stock, but allows for deep mulch and a lot of conservation. Increasing your soil carbon. For every 1% increase in soil carbon per hectare, you get an extra 144,000 liters of water storage in your soil. So increasing your soil carbon is, is important. And what- Soil carbon. So the more roots you have in the ground, the more potential opportunities for those roots to decay and become carbon that's trapped into the ground. Um, I know Brian Smallshaw even deals with, um, with uh, charcoalized carbon, biochar, which is excellent because it, it does very much the same thing. And it, the more biology that you have in your soil, you think about biology being all the little microbes and bacteria, and I like to think of those as water balloons. So the more water balloons that you have in your soil, when something comes along and eats one of the water balloons, it releases its water and puts it into the soil. So there, there's a whole host of different things that you can do. Um, and Maxine really also spoke about um, having good, strong forests in place, because if you have got your forests in place and your forest duff in place, you've got the ability for the water to slow down and sink in rather than running across the landscape. But you've also been able to shade the land so you're not getting quite as much evapotranspiration from the, from the ground heating up. So those are sort of the things that, that we deal with here at our place. Uh, so you awesome. Think about, you think about shade, you think about mulch, you think about increasing the biodiversity and the and, and the, the compostability of the resources that you have on your land in order to create more moisture in your soils. Yep. Less runoff to happen. Yes. Thank you. I, I'm noticing a, a pile of resources that have been indicated in the chat room. So I want to re remind everybody that's left with us, we've got quite a few, that uh, we'll, be, we'll be passing out the chat uh, uh, information as well. Uh, so you can c connect with those resources and, and the resources recommended by, by our three panelists. Uh, that will be coming to you later from TSS. So. Uh, there's going to be some really good uh, possibilities for answering some of these questions too. Uh, Erin Ann says that she will follow up with a link that uh, you can save to yourself. 
Um, so any other questions or let's see. Um, Paul has pointed out that large Western red cedars uh, are suffering. Um, do you think, uh, panelists, that uh, I know that with climate change, we're looking at Western red cedars. Of course, another problem is the diseases in Arbutus. Uh, do you think we're, uh, we have a chance for actually helping hold that off uh, in terms of the death of the uh, of these trees and it, am I I'm, I'm not muted but I think Patty is if you wanted to speak Patty okay any 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 panelists comments on uh, on the, the issues ar around uh, too little water for their for our trees I can speak to it um, if you want. Uh, I've been working on that within the CRD uh, and uh, with a vegetation management strategy. Um, so with the hotter, drier summers, what we have seen is we have seen more stress on the uh, on the red cedars, and that's happening from Northern California all the way on up the coast. It's also happening with Doug firs as well. And so as they're drying out and getting heat stress with their upper roots, uh, it is opening them and weakening them and opening them up for disease. And those diseases come in the form of pests such as uh, the fur beetle. Uh, and they also come in the form of about several different uh, fungal species that naturally exist, but are starting to prey on them. So I think that um, there's not much, unless we are able to dramatically change the, uh, the, the pathway that the climate is impacting, um, and most of the work has come out of the Oregon State University, there is not um, a happy end story for the red cedars up the coast, and there's not a happy end story for some of the Douglas fir stands either. It's a grim, uh, grim reality of climate change, and uh, uh, I know we're going to be ch challenged a lot over the next years. And so, fortunately, we have Transition Salt Spring uh, working on some of these problems and bringing great speakers like Grant, Gord, and Maxine together for an event like this. I, I, I'm uh, thinking that it's probably time that we can. Uh, in this and leave our participants with the idea that that uh, they can get involved with Transition Salt Spring. I certainly would like to thank uh, all the members of the Transition Salt Spring uh, Education Committee and the staff at Transition Salt Spring for facilitating this. And of course, thank you three, uh, Gord, Grant, and Maxine for incredible presentations and and expertise and answering these questions. I'm sure they're going to be more in the future. There's all kinds of things coming through uh, the chat room that uh, are going to be shared with our participants and you'll add, add to that, I think. So uh, unless you had any final, if you do have any final thoughts uh, in, in uh, anyone from our panel, uh, you could provide those now. Uh, anybody want to make a final statement here uh, to our audience? No, well, uh, is it okay then to, to cut it off and uh, we'll meet again sometime soon? I'm, uh, I, I have to say, Gord and, and Grant, not having ever met you before, I'm so impressed with the, your work and I'm looking forward to getting over to EcoSense uh, in, in the highlands of Victoria uh, to, uh, to have, a, have a personal meeting and see what you're up to there with your great facility. So thank you all for coming. And uh, I'll sign off now for uh, for the event. Thank you very much.